Yeah. Come on, put your hands together. Bible. Do you read it? 
do you cherish it? Do you hide it in your heart? Is it a consistent part of your journey? Or does it sit and collect dust? Do you apply it to your whole life? Or just listen to the parts that are convenient for you? Does it matter to you? Truly? Deeply? Matter? The Bible is God's word to his people. It's the blueprint by which we walk this life. It's comfort in times of need and clarity in times of confusion. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It's wisdom when there's confusion and certainty when there's doubt. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible. Do you read it? Giants come calling my name. Oh, my God, so much bigger than troubles I face. Yeah. And why would I hunger for power or riches or fame? Oh, my God. So much better than all of these things. So I won't be shaken, and I won't be moved. My God is faithful, His promise is true. So I My God is bigger, better, stronger, greater than you. My enemies scatter, cause they know the battle is won. Yes, it is. My God is stronger, the victory is already won.
Well, thanks for joining us here at Calvary Temple Online again this week. Hey, take your Bible, open it to Romans chapter 10. Verse 17, we're gonna be looking at one verse today, Romans 10, verse 17, as we continue to talk about more. Hey, hopefully you had a great Valentine's week this past week. Uh, I I found some memes that I thought kind of uh, related to that whole thing. Many of you probably went out to eat, and and, uh, and I thought about this one. The girl, they're at the restaurant, probably on a date here at Valentine's Day, and the girl says, restaurant bills are designed to be paid by men. That's why it's called a menu. The man says, oh, you're wrong. It's actually me in you, me in you. I guess he thinks it should be shared. I'm not sure that date went well. Anyway, speaking of that, uh, I I thought about this one with uh, couples. Always make sure that someone in the relationship has good credit. That's why it's called significant other. Sign if I can't. Significant, sign if I can't, you know. So at least somebody is, is capable of paying the bill, I guess. Hey, I thought this was funny Uh, as a billboard and had this on it. This year, thousands of men will die from stubbornness. And then underneath, somebody had handwritten, no, we won't. Kind of proves a point, huh? Speaking of that, this husband, uh, and I I love this one. The husband says, well, after just a week at home, I've come up with a comprehensive list on how to do things more efficiently around here, honey. And uh, then underneath the caption says, the real reason many men don't live long after retiring. Truth, right? truth. Speaking of that, kind of remind me of this one, this, this comic I follow quite often. The grandpa says to, says to his grandson, he said, most men my age don't have regular jobs anymore, Nelson. So what we do to be useful is to give advice to others. You miss some dirt in that corner over there, dear, and then we run. Well, speaking of relationships, Red Skelton, many of you probably remember him. Red Skelton was one of my favorite comedians of all time, and Red Skelton made this statement one time. He said, I married Miss Wright. I just didn't know her first name was always. And then again, speaking of relationships, this defines the term relationship goals, doesn't it? Right? I mean, how do you go wrong there? Anyway, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, reads this way. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you today for your love and your mercy and your grace. I thank you, Lord, for the faith that you placed inside of each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, to allow that faith to grow, to to be active in our life, to be doers of your word, to be uh, those that trust you and, and, and step out in faith following you where you lead. And so, Lord, speak through this mouthpiece today and challenge us, and we're giving you the praise and the glory and all the honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're continuing our series, uh, More, that I've entitled More, and, and it's a series on faith. You know, we're tapping in to the, its full potential, the, faith, the full potential of faith. Faith is the key to unlocking God's power in your life. Faith is really the key to opening the door of God's blessing in your life. And as we see again and again and again throughout the Bible, especially in the Gospels, God responds to your faith. Like Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done for you. Now, as we've already seen in the first weeks of this series, faith's not a feeling. It's not a feeling that you have. In fact, it has really nothing to do with your feelings or your emotions. It has to do with your thoughts and your actions. Faith isn't something that you feel. It's something that you decide, and it's something you do. You decide. In other words, you choose to have faith-filled thoughts and to adopt an attitude of expectancy that God's going to do great things in your life. And then you express your faith through corresponding actions. You're doing things that are consistent with what you're asking God to do. So if you can't stir up emotions that feel like great faith, don't worry about it. Because regardless of how you feel, you can choose to do these two things. You can choose to think with an attitude of expectancy, and you can choose to follow through with corresponding actions. Now with that said, today we're going to talk about how that you can build your faith, how you can make your faith grow, how you can go from being a 98-pound faith weakling to being a strong, brawny, muscle-bound person of faith. We're going to talk about things that you can do that will make it easier to think the kind of thoughts that are consistent with great faith, and, and, and it will make it easier for you to take the kind of actions that are consistent with great faith. These things will also help you to feel better about all that's going on in your life. So let's talk about your feelings for a minute. I've said again and again that we don't live by feelings, that we live by faith. Now, it's really not all that important how you feel, but it's important how you faith. 
how, how much you trust God to fulfill his promises in your life. You see, if you're like me, your feelings may be up one day and down the next day. You know, mine vary depending on a number of factors from the weather to my diet to how well my sports teams are doing to how many dumb things maybe I've done that day and I could go on and on and on. Sometimes you'll feel optimistic about everything that's going on in your life and sometimes you won't feel optimistic about anything that's going on in your life. It's not really important how you feel though. What's important is whether or not you continue to think faith-filled thoughts and you take faith-filled actions that are consistent with what you're asking God to do in your life. You see, good feelings will not lead you to great faith. If anything, they'll mislead you. However, great faith will lead you ultimately to good feelings about your life. I mean, when I am, am consistently walking in faith, I feel better. In fact, there's a spring in my step. Problems don't slow me down as much. Criticism doesn't affect me as much. Challenges don't intimidate me as much. When I'm walking in faith, consistently thinking the things that God wants me to think, consistently doing the things that God wants me to do, I, I just feel better. You know, we don't live by our feelings, but it sure is nice when we feel good, isn't it? So if your life has become an emotional roller coaster, I'm talking about full of ups and downs, or, or even worse, if, if, if the ups seem to have all but disappeared and you're only experiencing the down these days, then, then I believe today's message will help you. And by the way, the key in, in, to feeling better is not found in focusing on your feelings. You might be thinking, well, may, maybe a cocktail will make me feel better. Or maybe a pizza or ice cream will make me feel better. Or maybe making more money will make me feel better. Or maybe having a, a, an office fling will make me feel better. Listen, the truth is that none of these things are gonna help. They won't make you feel better, not for more than just a, a few minutes or maybe a day or two at best. In fact, if you've tried any of these things, you already know that they only make matters worse and they ultimately lead to more misery. However, when you walk in faith, I'm talking about thinking right, doing right, it isn't long before you find yourself feeling right. I've been emphasizing this idea since the series began, and that's this. Walking in faith means consistently thinking the right kind of thoughts and consistently taking the right kinds of actions. Let me say it again. Walking in faith means consistently thinking the right kinds of thoughts and consistently taking the right kind of actions. This opens the door to God doing great things in your life. Now, the key word there is consistently, which brings us to today's message. Many people think, you know, I know that I need to think right, and I know that I need to do right. It's just difficult to develop the habit, and, and it's difficult to know exactly what things that I should be thinking and doing. I mean, what are the right thoughts to think? What are the right things to do? Now, this is a good question because when I talk about having an attitude of expectancy, I'm not talking about just mere positive thinking. I'm talking about thinking the thoughts that God wants you to think, seeing the world through his eyes, perceiving the situation in the light of his truth. Some people try to have a, a positive mental attitude that really is based on nothing more than their own wishy-washy worldview. They adopt an attitude that says, you know what, if I have strong enough faith, I won't have problems. You know, nothing can be further from the truth. They tell themselves, well, if I have faith, I'll never get sick. Uh, if I have faith, everything will be easy. If I have faith, I'll always have plenty of money. If I have faith, everything will always go my way. Listen, it doesn't take long to find out that this is not how faith works. I've also seen people try to zero in on one verse of scripture taken out of context. They try to use it to define faith in a way that is completely inconsistent with what the rest of the Bible teaches about the subject. For example, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 21, verse 22, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. And I've heard people use this verse in some really crazy ways, in ways that Jesus never meant for his promise to be used. I, in fact, I once heard about a couple who tried to use this verse to get out of buying gasoline. Here's what happened. They had been to a faith seminar where they heard a, a thrilling testimony from an airplane pilot who, in the midst of a terrible storm, lost radio contact with uh, the control tower and, and completely ran out of fuel. So he claimed Matthew 21, 22, and God miraculously enabled the plane to stay in the air until the pilot was able to make a safe landing. So this couple decided, well, if God can do it for that pilot, he can do it for us. And so when they started home from the seminar, they decided not to fill up the tank with gas. They had plenty of money 
to buy gas. They, 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 they saw plenty of gas stations along the way, but they passed them all, saying, we're believing God to make our car run without gasoline. Well, they were out in the middle of nowhere when the needle dropped below E and the engine began to sputter and they finally coasted to a stop. They tried repeatedly to start the car without success and eventually the battery drained and so did their spirits. They were crushed because Matthew 21, 22 didn't work for them. Listen, clearly, this is not how this promise was intended to be applied. And and, and it's not just well-meaning but confused believers that get this wrong. I've often heard critics of Christianity use some of the faith promises as proof that that, that prayer doesn't work. They say, you know, something like, well, Jesus said, whatever you ask for, you will receive. So why can't you ask him to heal all the sick people or give you a million dollars or make your car run without gasoline? Listen, I want to address this for just a minute. For the sincere believers who sometimes misapply the promise and also for the cynics who distort them to try to use them as ammunition against Christianity. It's very simple, actually. Every promise in the Bible as well as every commandment must be read not only in the context of the passage, but also in the context of the entire teaching of Scripture. And and they also must be read with a certain amount of maturity. Let me give an example. In in our family, when it's your birthday, we try to let our kids and our grandkids choose a, a place to go out to eat for their birthday, you know, for their birthday dinner. Well, today is my granddaughter Hope's birthday, and so what if I said to her that I'm gonna take her out to dinner for her birthday, and I said, hey, wherever you wanna go, we'll go. You just name the time and the place. Now, if Hope wanted to be irrational about it, she could say to me, Pops, that's a very bold and unconditional promise, and therefore, I decided that I want to eat at the office depot in Manhattan, Missouri, in one hour. Now, if I said, oh, sorry, honey, that's not going to happen, she might come back with, oh, wait a minute, you said we'll eat wherever, wherever I want, and I'm trusting in your promise. Or if she was a cynic, she might have said, aha, I knew it. This proves that you're a liar and, you, and don't really exist. Listen, the problem with this hypothetical situation isn't in my promise. It's in the way that she distorted my promise to make it a foolish request. Now, what was wrong with her, her request? Well, several things. Number one, Office Depot doesn't serve food. They, they do office products. And number two, there is no such place as Manhattan, Missouri. And thirdly, there's no way we could get there in an hour because it doesn't exist. Now, fortunately, when I say we'll eat wherever you want, Hope would be able to contextualize the promise. And she understands that in this particular case, it applies to places near uh, St. Charles that actually serve food. In fact, she would, you know, rather than, you know, taking a a simple offer for a meal and stretching it beyond reality, she would most likely choose somewhere like a Texas Roadhouse or a Monocles because she likes those restaurants. You see, the promises promises of Scripture are so powerful and so life-changing that it doesn't really make any sense at all to try to make them say what they don't really say or try to use them in a way that they weren't meant to be used. It's not necessary. Taking in context and applying with spiritual maturity, the promises of Scripture can provide you with the life of your dreams. Now, the question is, how do you know how to apply the promises? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 21, 22, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, using this in an attempt to get out of buying gasoline is foolish. But in a more subtle matters, how do you know where to draw the line? How do you know the difference between a foolish request and a genuine faith? How do you develop the right kind of faith? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17 here, he says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He also, I love the way the message says it in in verse 17. It says, so faith comes from hearing the good news and people hear the good news when someone tells them about Christ. Listen, if you wanna develop faith, you listen to the good news, the message of Jesus Christ through his word. And the more you hear his word, the stronger your faith becomes. You know, people who are strong in faith ask God for great things and he delivers. People that are strong in faith know when a request is right and know when it isn't right. They won't ask God to make their car go without gasoline, but they will ask him to move in their lives in other ways, in in more appropriate ways. As your faith grows, so does your wisdom and your discernment. Now, the flip side of asking God to make a car run without gas is not asking God for anything at all. I know many Christians who are this way. I mean, when they have a need, they don't ask God to meet it because they don't have the faith that he will. 
they need their faith to be developed. They, they need their faith to grow. Now, how does that happen? Well, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. The more that you hear the word of Christ, the stronger your faith becomes. Now, when I say hear the word of Christ, what exactly do I mean? Well, I'm gonna tell you, actually very quickly, five areas where you can hear the word of Christ. And if you'll saturate yourself with his word, and, and, and do your best to cover all five areas consistently, your faith will grow in wisdom and in discernment. You will learn what God wants you to think and what God wants you to do. You can develop maturity as a believer and you'll experience God's power in your life. Here are five areas you can hear the word of Christ. The first is pretty obvious, reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. You hear the word of Christ when you read the Bible. I encourage you, if you're not already doing it, I encourage you to add reading scripture into your daily routine. Some of you think that maybe you should be reading the Bible for 30 minutes a day or an hour a day or more. And, and, and of course it goes without saying, the more that you read God's word, the better. But if you don't have 30 minutes or an hour yet, spend whatever time that you can reading the scriptures. Read a Psalm or a proverb or read a parable or read two or three verses from one of the epistles and then ask God to speak to you through what you've read. And he'll honor every minute that you spend in the word of God. When you read the Bible, you hear the word of Christ. Now, another way that you can hear the word of Christ, number two, is hearing sermons and teachings. Now, here's my promise to you. When I preach, I do my best to encourage you in your faith, to help you to think the right things and to do the right things. But sometimes, as we go through the week, we forget what was said on Sunday. And so this is why we have all of our sermons from Sunday service online. Not just for those that aren't able to be here during the week, but they're also there for you to be able to go back and listen to them again and again and again. Now also, you can read books by Christian authors, listen to other sermons and teachings. You can come to the small groups here at Calvary Temple you, you, you know, and just hear the word of Christ. Let the sermons and the teachings encourage you in your faith. The third thing is listening to music. I love it that we live in a time when you can turn on the radio and you can hear uplifting Christian music or you can go on Spotify or other music apps and you can listen to Christian music whenever you want. There is an incredible wave of praise and worship music being played today all over the place. And, and it's filled with scripture and accolades for Jesus. And so I'm gonna encourage you, find some praise and worship music that you can relate to and listen to it every day. The fourth thing is talking to friends. Now I have some friends who, when I talk to them, I know they're gonna tell me whatever they think I wanna hear. And I have some friends who, when I talk to them, they're gonna tell me something negative, no matter what, we're, what it is we're talking about. And I have some friends who, when I talk to them, they're gonna talk about nothing but themselves. I mean, this is just part of the cost of having friends. But the great thing is that I have some friends who, when I talk to them, they speak to me with wisdom and compassion and honesty. They talk to me about what God is doing in their life and in their family and in their church. They encourage me to stay faithful and they, they challenge me to do better. And, and, and I walk away from every conversation a little bit stronger than before. So identify this type of person among your circle of friends and then listen to what they say. And if you didn't have any friends that can speak the word of Christ to you, find a few. God speaks to you through your friends. And then lastly, speak in your own words. Your own words, Practice speaking the word of Christ. Instead of saying, oh man, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen. Practice instead saying, I believe God's about to do something great in my life. Instead of talking to everyone about the bad news in your life or in their life, talk about the good news. Talk about the possibilities. Speak words of encouragement and hope and faith. And you'll be surprised at how much your own words can help you to grow in your Christian faith. These are five areas where you hear the word of Christ. And it's crucial that we hear the word of Christ because that's where faith comes from. In fact, in closing, let me just say this. Romans 10, 17 tells us, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. The more you saturate yourself with God's word, the more you get in the habit of thinking right and, and doing right. And the more wisdom and discernment you develop, the more your faith grows. The more inspired you are to believe God for great things, the more that you see him at work in your life and the more he changes you from the inside out. I'm challenging you to grow more in 24. Grow more in your faith. How do we do it? Faith comes from hearing, 
and hearing from the Word of God. Let's get into the Word of God. Let the words of Christ help to cause our faith to grow more in 24. You know, today, maybe you've never opened your heart or life to Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you. God loves you so much that he allowed his son Jesus to come and die upon the cross of Calvary to pay the price for your sins, for my sins, for the the sins of all mankind. He did it once and for all. And he he paid the price for our sins to give us a fresh slate, a, a clean start. But we have to receive that gift. He's offering it to us free. We have to receive that gift of his forgiveness. If you never open your heart to receive, you can just say this right now. Just pray this with me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I want to begin a relationship with you right here, right now. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, in the comment section, Pastor, I prayed that prayer so I can celebrate and rejoice with you. You know, for many of us, this is our heart's desire to grow more in faith, to believe God for more. God wants to do great things. We've talked about it, to expect more. We've talked about how we can do more. And this week, we're talking about how we want to grow more in 24. I believe that's your heart's desire as well. So let's close in prayer, asking God to help us to put these principles into practice this year and and, and in the future. Father, thank you so much that, Lord, it's your desire that we grow in our faith. That, our, that faith inside of us just grows and develops in a way that we have the, the, the maturity and the, and the discernment and the wisdom to put that faith into practice in our lives. Lord, our expectancy is, is rising as we've asked you to help grow that expectancy in our life because we believe expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles to take place. Lord, so we know it's, it's about thinking and, 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 and dreaming big dreams, thinking and expecting great things, and then doing things that are consistent with it, putting that faith into action by following through. And Lord, we ask you to help that faith inside of us to grow as we put those things into practice. We give you the praise and the glory for all that you're gonna do because you're wanting to do more in our life in 24. We thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you. Hey, we look forward to seeing you next week.